Welcome back, everyone. And to introduce this session, um, I'm very pleased for you to meet my friend, Wabena Asen Menz, who is founder of MFED Farms here in Ghana. I interviewed Kwabena recently on his farm on the effects of climate change on cocoa farming. So we'll be hearing from him in just a moment. And right after the video with Kwabena, Ethan Budiansky will take over to moderate this panel on traceability. My name is Kobana Asan Mays. I'm the CEO of MFED Farms and Trading Company Limited. I'm actually a cocoa farmer. I am a born cocoa farmer. My grandparents, my parents were all cocoa farmers. Yes, I was educated with cocoa money, actually. Yeah, the main season this year has been very slow. Yeah, we are not harvesting pork as we used to harvest in the October, November, December. The reason being that last year, around December, January, there was much rain. And as a result of that, we had a good minor season harvest, which was a, a long, a little bit long, yes. And at the time that the new flowers that needs to develop into the uh, minor, uh, the main season one, there was uh, very much sunshine. I think about a month or a month and a half and it affected the flowers and the cherries that will develop into the pot. So we are harvesting, but it is few. Yeah, we are hoping that the way it is raining now, we are hoping that it rains up to December and early January, then we will anticipate a very high minor season harvest instead of the main season. Yes, there is, there is. I think when I was young, my parents used to harvest uh, they, we call it a kofintem, that is a minor season harvest. And we used to harvest during that time a lot. But for the past three years, MFED have not harvested, not MFED, central region here, and I think most part of Ghana, we've not had a minor season harvest at all. It's all been the main season. The reason being that the drought, the, the, there's been much sunshine during the December, January, February. And when there is a sexy sunshine like that, it really destroyed the flowers and the new small, small pores that we developed into the pores. Yes, they all dried out. Yes, it is. The climate has totally changed. Now we cannot predict when it to rain again. My father and my grandfather could tell you it will rain this month, this very week it's going to rain. But now when you predict, you fail. Yes, it's not regular. It doesn't come at the time that we need. And you know, this is Rainfield agriculture we are doing here. And it has really affected us. The climate has really affected us. It is happening. Deforestation. A lot of trees, if I understand well, a lot of trees are being cut. Yes, they, they carry them here. If you are to spend some minutes here, you will see some of the logs being carried away on tracks. Yes. Um, what pains me most is that they are cutting the trees in our cocoa farm. In Ghana, we, you, the farmer don't have authority over the tree which is in your farm. Yeah, it is the government. So the government gives consignment to contractors, which our local authorities, the chiefs and whatever, are not even notified. And before you realize they are in your farm, cutting the trees. They cut, it destroy your cocoa tree. And we have been educated that as a result of the cutting of the trees, that is why it is not raining regularly here. Yes, I think our extension officers have given us that education. And to my little understanding, we have also observed that cocoa trees that are under trees, that's better. Even when there is uh, sexy sunshine, they does better yeah, than those in the direct sun. So um, the climate or the deforestation really have huge impact. I think that um, <laughs> The deforestation gave birth to the uh, uh, the current. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kwabena, um, for this great testimony. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ethan Budiansky. I'm the Director of Environment here at the World Cocoa Foundation, and I'm going to be moderating our next session on traceability. Now, this testimony from Kwabena aligns very well with 
um, Justin Adams presentation yesterday coming out of COP26 about the utter importance with regards to addressing these issues around climate change and deforestation. Now, in our work to, to, towards um, tackling deforestation in direct alignment with our um, cocoa and forest initiative, fundamental to that is traceability. Really understanding where the cocoa that ultimately turns into the chocolate bars that we all love, um, where that cocoa is actually coming from. And not just down to an aggregation point, but all the way down to the farmer, down to the actual farm in which it's grown. So today, we are going to have a discussion about what is happening in the world of traceability, right? What, what new innovations are being put in place? Where are the investments? What's happening at the level of the government? What's happening at the level of the, uh, of the companies, the cooperatives? And ultimately, how does this impact the farmer? Ideally, how does it benefit the farmer? So to get into this conversation, what I, I've got a really great panel that um, I'm going to introduce now, and then we're going to jump into some questions. So first off, we've got Benjamin Walker. He's with the Conseil du Café Cacao. He's the technical secretary of the public-private partnership platform at the Conste. Then we have Dr. Emmanuel Opoku. Um, he is the deputy chief executive of um, officer, excuse me, at the Ghana Cocoa Board. Olivier Zwolzman, he is a re responsible sourcing manager at Ferrero. Stephanie Kadjo, sustainable sourcing manager at Cargill West Africa. And then Abu Drame Traore, he's the export manager of Dexploitation of Kayat, a cooperative in Cote d'Ivoire. So let's start this conversation off, please, with Mr. Benjamin Walker. Mr. Walker, I would love for you to talk a little bit about what's happening at the level of the Conseil with regards to, to um, improving traceability. Um, where, 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 what progress have you had so far? Where are you headed within Cote d'Ivoire? What challenges you are experiencing? I'd love for you to, to dive a little bit deeper into this. Over to you, Mr. Walker. Is this better now? Can you hear me? Perfectly. The progress that we obtained, oh, we just have to, it's, okay, great. Can I continue? Okay, great. Can I continue? It's good, okay? It's good right now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please continue. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, okay. So, the traceability system placement is done with the idea that was uh, created for the uh, Cacao and Forest Initiative for the government of Cote d'Ivoire. It is something very important because traceability for us is also a commercial matter since it allows to guarantee access to European markets and American markets. And the uh, European Union is only, uh, it's not just less than 7%, uh, 67% that goes uh, there. So, with the partners that are members of the government, the members of the um, cacao and chocolate industries, the ONG, together decided to design a system. With that, a study was conducted, and so these points were, uh, were pinpointed. So, after the study, with the traceability, we had to make a roadmap of the stakeholders of the value chain. And so we started with the uh, resensing of their production. It is very important because it allowed for 
the mapping of about 2 million uh, 600 um, acres of cacao. So these are these are numbers that have already been shared, so I'm not really going to give you an exact number. But already with this um, census, we are able now to move forward. And so today, we are facing production, distribution of these maps to the producers. Because if you remember, after the producer census, since each one of them were, were identified, each one of them will have a map where there will be their 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 photo their the name and they will all these badges will be electronic and all of this needs certain uh, institutional arrangements with the authorities with the bank you know financial authorities we are working with the professional association of banks with BCAO and also the RTC that here had the authority to regulate anything that has to do with communication that also uh, deals with personal data. So this is what the census takes care of. And currently we are uh, designing and implementing a solution of the traceability system because uh, there's a lot of, of, of information since it's a platform that will be created and designed and will work online. Um, so this is an, an information system, right? And we are also designing the marking on the bags for traceability in the frame of, of internal uh, uh, commerce. And you know that traceability is based on legal texts that we have to create. So this is where we are as far as this goes. And of course, the challenges are important. We have technical challenges that are being raised, but, there, but the, the, the future technical problems are going to be about the leveling and modernization of existing systems. So certain private sector companies in, the, in their traceability system, uh, but of course we are going to need to modernize them and to update them so that they can respond to the same specifics that, uh, the, you know, in the national system that would like to unify. And when we say unify, we're not talking about a government system. We are talking about a system that is uh, used by the entire system of the value supply or chain. The next, the second challenge is maintaining from top managers all the way to the end of the scale, because everybody's going to be engaged to guarantee transparency of, of this information uh, that is going to be put in the database. So I think that there are other challenges that we are going to face, but as we go along from the, the launch, from the creation um, to the nature of the system, I think that this is what we are going to hear a lot from the private sector before we move on to the generalization. So this is what I wanted to um, exchange with you. Thank you very much. Ethan? Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Walker, for, for, for your great comments. What I'd like to now is go from Cote d'Ivoire over to Ghana. And that means that we're going to talk to Mr. Dr. Emmanuel Opoku. Now, Dr. Opoku, for over 20 years, the Ghana Cocoa Board has been leading, has been leading a, a um, centralized marketing, cocoa marketing platform um, that incorporates traceability as well. But very recently, you've been doing a lot of investment in the cocoa management system, which I, I believe is what you're going to talk about right now. I would love for you to give our audience a bit of a flavor as to where Ghana is now headed with regards to traceability. Where are your major investments? Why are you even doing this in the first place? And maybe a little bit about what's the roadmap to, to move into this whole cocoa management system that, that you have yourself been, been um, leading. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning to all participants. And uh, thank you, welcome uh, to Ghana's uh, time. Uh, yes, uh, I want to say that, yes, in, the, in fact, since this industry was established in Ghana, we have been able to 
and maintain a certain quality trait. And that essentially is our ability to trace cocoa from who graded it, the, 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 the technical person who graded or the grader of that cocoa to the buyer or from the buyer to the grader of the cocoa, if you want to go back. That we know as our quality, one of our quality hallmarks. And as the world moves to tracing cocoa to the farm, we felt that there was a need for us to continue. And then uh, the missing gap, which is from the depot where the cocoa was graded to the farmer's farm or to the land the cocoa was sourced, we should be able to find a way to, tr to trace it also so that we can guarantee that transparency in our supply chain. And for us, we want to do this to make sure that uh, for every buyer to know that Ghana's quality criteria has been uh, maintained without, uh, without any problems. One uh, way to also do that was, uh, is to show to the world that cocoa from Ghana should be coming from only lands approved for use for agricultural purposes. We, we are against deforestation, cocoa-driven deforestation. We know that cocoa can only be used uh, to, to restore the forest, but we do not want situations where we, we, we will encourage growers to go into reserve forest and plant cocoa. So that is why for us, we are happy that this traceability thing is, is, has become very topical and uh, uh, interested in the value chain. So what we are doing with the CMS is now to take all the GPS addresses of every cocoa farm in Ghana and then put that in a database, including the owners, the, that's the, the household data, that's the, the value data and the household information of the owners of those individual farms put that in the data and then track all the production from the, from the individual polygons to the buyer. So pretty soon, starting October, 2022, every bag of cocoa that goes from Ghana to the buyer would have a tag which you can walk back to the land on which the cocoa was grown. Somebody may ask, you know, you don't. You, you may you may bulk cocoa from different farmers, and then uh, a bag. Yes, we you still can trace back to the lands or to the uh, addresses that contributed to that cocoa in every bag. So, for example, if we decided to bulk uh, cocoa from ten farmers with different addresses and 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 rebag to the buyer. You, we, the tracking system is such that the, the label will be said that you can track the cocoa to the 10 farmers' farms. So you know that the bag can be traced to the farmers that contribute to the cocoa. So this is the kind of thing we are doing. And I said the objective is to show to the world or to all uh, you know, uh, buyers that our system is transparent, our system, our cocoa is free. And, and so you can be certain that you, when you buy cocoa from Ghana, you are doing the right thing where Ghana is contributing to, to, to sequestrate carbon using cocoa by first not allowing farmers to go into uh, reserve forest and then second using cocoa to, to restore the, uh, the, the landscape that has been degraded already. So this is the key reason our objective by so doing, we are able to, to meet the requirements that our buyers are asking us to do. That is the due diligence that, uh, that today all buyers are requesting that suppliers of cocoa ensure that there is due diligence and then you can trace the cocoa to the source of, of, of that particular cocoa beans. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Apoku. Um, so I, you know, so we started off by getting some good perspective 
um, from, from the national level, what's happening in, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, where you know, two thirds of all cocoa production um, comes from. What I would like to do now is, is move the conversation over to the companies who are implementing traceability directly in their supply chains. And I'd like to start off with, with Mr. Um, um, Olivier Wolzman. Olivier, what I would like to ask you first is why is traceability important in your work and the work of Ferrero, um, the work of the industry um, towards more sustainable cocoa? What is your ultimate vision for traceability within your company? Um, what are you demanding of, of, um, of your partners within the value chain? What do customers want? And how is this then linked to due diligence and the broader vision of, of sustainability? So I'll, um, Olivier, over to you, please. Okay, um, can you hear me well? Just checking, uh, thanks. Now, a pleasure to be to participate in this uh, panel, which is indeed uh, addressing a very important topic uh, within uh, cocoa sustainability. But I mean, I would like to put it broader than just sustainability. I mean, the way that we see it, the traceability is really a key driver of our overall quality promise to consumers. And so it's really, uh, and quality, when we say quality, it's really in the broadest sense possible. I mean, we want to make sure that the cocoa that we use in our products and put in the market are of the highest quality and freshness and also produced in a responsible way. I mean, those two have to go together. Um, and so in order to, uh, to achieve this, I think a few things are relevant. Uh, for Ferro, uh, it means that we source the majority of our beans, of our cocoa as raw beans, which we process in our own uh, facilities. And sourcing these beans as uh, physical traceable, so segregated, from dedicated farm groups with whom we would develop long-term relationships. Uh, I mean, that is really uh, essential. And we have been also mapping the farmers from our dedicated farm groups already for many years using the technology available, uh, starting years ago with geotraceability uh, and also today. And, and we, uh, the positive thing, of course, that this is uh, continuously evolving, the possibilities to, uh, to uh, track farmers in your supply chain. And, through this, uh, say, sourcing approach, uh, buying also beans is physically traceable. It means that you know where and who you're sourcing from. And that is, I think, the, the, uh, the basic starting point for everything. Uh, I mean, it allows us to have reach a high level of traceability. But I would say more importantly, it enables us to drive positive change for farmers and communities, you know, in our supply chain and beyond that. Uh, and if I look also at the, uh, the draft uh, regulation on deforestation that was published yesterday by the EU, it also clearly highlights that traceability is a necessary starting point to perform mandatory due diligence. Um, so I also um, expect that in the uh, EU COCA talks, the topic of traceability will be uh, continued this discussion and to see how we can collaborate uh, to this uh, collectively. Thank you, Olivier. <clears throat> so Olivier is coming from the perspective of, uh, of a manufacturer of a branded company. So what, what we thought would be very interesting then is to talk to the actual supplier companies who are doing this work on the ground and who are making significant investments in improving the traceability of the cocoa that they are ultimately purchasing. So let's jump now over to Stephanie Caggio um, um, from Cargo. And, and Stephanie, what I would appreciate you talking a bit about is what's happening within Cargo to improve traceability and how are you then communicating this to, to your clients, the manufacturers, the retailers? And, and where do you see this leading um, in, in the you know, short to long term? Over to you, Stephanie. Okay. Um, thank you, Ethan. Can you hear me properly? Perfectly. Perfect. So uh, good afternoon to everyone or good morning, depending on where you are. So as Cargill, we have the goal to reach 100% uh, farm to factory traceability in our direct uh, supply chain by 2030. Uh, 
our goal is to effectively increase the transparency and the traceability in our supply chain. And we also want to improve cocoa farming practices and community well-being. So I know that traceability might have a different uh, definition depending on the stakeholder. But for us, physical traceability means we have to meet uh, a very high standard. Uh, that's mean uh, in, it's involved tracing back the, the cocoa to the farmer and its farm. So we have decided to use technology to do this. So technology is really at the heart of our strategy. We partnered with companies like FarmForce to put in place a number of tools that allow us to verify traceability and sustainability data. Uh, we do this verification downstream, that's meant from Cargill to our customers, but also upstreams from our suppliers to, uh, to Cargill. So uh, the suite of, uh, of digital tools I was talking about is named um, CocoaWise, and we use it to obtain and document origin information, such as uh, the size of the farm, the, the GPS uh, addresses of the farm, uh, the, the amount of cocoa sold by each farmer and transfer those uh, traceability, that, traceability data throughout the supply chain. Uh, uh, for instance, in Ivory Coast, we offer farmer organization a digital tool. We also call it CMS, but this time for COP management system. And uh, this tool is used to manage finance, inventory, first my traceability for the members, for the cooperative members. Uh, the system is integrated. It's, told, it's fully digital, and we use a barcode to buy uh, cocoa from the farm to the, to the factory. So each bag will have a barcode. And this tool helps help us achieve and communicate real and quantifiable progress to our key stakeholders, including our customers. Uh, we have built a portal, a, digi a online portal, so it's a digital tool, which is called CocoaWise Portal. And this portal allows customers to, to connect directly and more deeply um, connect with the communities from which the cocoa uh, is sourced. And in addition to all these internal systems, we also collaborate with third party verification and certification organization. So uh, in short, let's say that to improve the traceability and uh, also the credibility of our sourcing, we are using the technology to deploy a, a range of digital solutions. And we think that by combining this solution with an evidence-based approach, we can track the impact of our sustainability effort, uh, establish a baseline of our work, and then pro uh, demonstrate the progress we made. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Let's keep moving down, because we you know, went nationally to the private sector, now let's go to the cooperatives. It's the cooperatives who are ultimately being tasked with, with doing the work on the ground to, to improve traceability. So we, I would like to now talk to Mr. Chalre. And what I'd love to hear from you is what are the new demands or how are demands changing on the cooperative with regards to, to improving traceability? How are you going about doing this? And Cooperatives are made up of farmers. So ultimately, what is expected of the farmer? And how does the farmer ultimately benefit from improved traceability? Over to you. Oui, bonsoir à tous. Bonsoir à tous. Je vous remercie de m'avoir convié. Good evening, everyone. I thank you so much. Aujourd'hui, comme on a lost the sound, we work with Cargill, and so we also put their systems into place. STMS, that, as she described, it also requires uh, inputs from the producers and their 
digital. So the people who intercede to implement the project need to be recycled and need to be trained on these tools, on the use of these tools. And today this creates uh, very good management because at the same time as the producer today as soon as we know all of his expenditures for his parcel of land we know what he's doing at the end of his uh, campaign or the end of his he's better organized with his expenditures but thanks to these systems, he has the ability to know what he spends and spends and what kind of income he's getting. So on one side, it gives us a certain gives us a certain amount of credibility. It gives him a certain amount of credibility, and also allows him access to microcredit. I'd like to say that it's a little bit difficult, but towards the end the, of the process, the traceability is well implemented, implemented and gives us greater credibility. Sorry, the interpreter's losing the sound. Um, so even for cooperatives, it allows a traceability, but also at the level of the producer. So, but for the uh, the management of the cooperative becomes more efficient as far as the management goes it is it's very good to put into place a good system of traceability it definitely helps the cooperative access international markets so that's what i would like to say on this subject Thank you very much. Let's talk a bit more about the farmer. And what I'd like to do now is to go back to, let's start with Dr. Opoku, please. Um, Emmanuel, what, what I would love for you to talk about a bit is, Kokobad is in the middle of completing a farmer census. You're engaging directly with the farmers. Uh, there, there's a whole sensitization component of the work that you're doing. Where, how do you see the connection between the cocoa management system being developed and the farmer? How do you see the, the, the benefits that come out of improved traceability in Ghana to ultimately benefit all of the farmers that are growing it? So, Emmanuel, I would love for you to give some, some thoughts on that. Over to you. Yes, so uh, at this level, as we are the, at the investment stage, where we are taking down the census of the farmers and then developing the, the, the database. In fact, the whole system itself has been developed already. We now have the, uh, our traceability, the, the, the system of even uh, paying, going to pay the farmer, everything developed. Now, what we need is the data to add up to make it work. Uh, we've, we've, we've gone back to the field to, to do the traceability itself. I mean, how we can track everything to the system. Now, how does this uh, maybe improve the farmer's uh, welfare? Uh, well, uh, this is something we were doing in the past from the society, from the depot level, or currently from the depot level, to the buyer. What we are doing right now is to close the gap. So we expect the, the following benefits for the farmer. The farmer can now be part of the financial system because now uh, the farmer is visible by every player in the in the in the in the, the, the CMS. And so uh, it, it, it will help to improve the farmer's access to finance. That is one major uh, objective of this uh, system that we put in place. Because now, if we know where he's farming from, we can tell his uh, land address, his farm address, 
then if as we can also track or the lender can even track the farmer's progress in terms of uh, farming uh, uh, outputs. So if the farmer needs support in, in, the, in the form of credit, it doesn't become difficult. Now on CocoaBot's own uh, front, one key stakeholder that is coming to the, uh, the CMS as the input supplier. Because we now have everything about the farmer you know, in, in, our, in our database, we are going to allow farmers to access input on credit. It can be 100%. The good thing is that because with the CMS, you cannot sell cocoa if you don't have the unique, unique identification that we are giving to the farmers. Every cocoa you sell has all information about your credit history will be there. As soon as you, you deliver the cocoa for sale, the, you know, if there, there are any debts that you have to pay, the system will calculate it and then everything will be shown to you. And so you have to pay whatever you need to pay and then you get a rest. Regardless of where you decide to sell your cocoa, because all buyers will be hooked onto the system where, and then uh, all their transactions, we at Cocoa Board, the regulator, can monitor the transactions of all buyers. So if a buyer even decided not to, uh, to buy cocoa from outside, that cocoa would, in, would not have any address. And so Cocoa Board can then confiscate the cocoa as cocoa that was purchased illegally. Now, if a buyer, uh, if you decided to buy cocoa from a buyer without taking whatever the buyer has to pay, then your margin will be taken to, to offset the bill. So that transparency that we are looking for is to, is to help the farmer in particular, because now the farmer, because of the way we have structured the system to make all his activity visible to Cocoa Board and to the one who buy the cocoa from the farmer, and perhaps anyone who, who may want to use the data for something under special uh, uh, approval, that buyer has access to credits and can produce cocoa legally. Uh, one thing is for sure, that if you are producing cocoa from the wrong address, we will not permit you because we've made it very clear and we are gradually uh, educating the farmers. It is over a period of 10 years along the Ghana Cocoa Red Plus pro program as uh, safeguards. So that when the 10 years are, are up, all farmers we identify to be producing from illegal forests will be, will be taken off the forest and allow the forest to stand. So for the good, and I repeat, the good thing the farmer is going to gain from this CMS is improved access to credit, to produce cocoa, to, to get the right input to produce cocoa sustainably. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. We're getting some really good questions coming in from, from the audience. And I'd like to now turn one of these questions directly to, to um, Benjamin. Benjamin, you know, to, to develop this national traceability system is, is obviously a huge effort um, and something that there's, while there's major investment now, maintaining it is, is going to require a lot of financial and other resources to keep a, a, a strong traceability system in place. So I've got a couple of questions that, that Benjamin, I'd like you to, to respond to. First off, you know, the major player, other major player in this is obviously the private sector. So how do you intend to engage directly with the companies, with the private sector towards the development and the implementation of a national traceability system? What is kind of your overall roadmap towards implementation, development and implementation of the system? And then how do you anticipate this will be funded now and, and also into the future? Merci. Thank you. I would like to remind that as far as the um, private system. Can you hear me? Are we good? Okay. We're good. Yes, we hear you. Okay. 
Okay, so the cooperation with the private uh, sector started since uh, the conception phases uh, of the traceability system. There is a traceability engine that was put in place in the uh, initiative of, uh, you know, CFI. And it is really because we had already had the idea uh, from the beginning, from the con conception to the um, to the export, without the collaboration of these two points. However, traceability is a tool that adds to the existing tools uh, for which the Cafe Cacao Council and the private sector have already uh, uh, worked on before, and they're used to that. So for them, the system of of, of marketing of cacao of cocoa. Uh, is based on the cooperation of these two parts, the private and the public. And since for us, traceability is a question of marketing, it won't be able to be done in a different way. Those who are already active in the commercialization or marketing of Cacao and Cote d'Ivoire already know our tools like the, the, the Golden Sea, which is our system of database to manage uh, the buy-in um, at, a, at a regional level, also the co-ops and the buyers, all the other societies, etc. They all have access to the same system. And it's the same thing for the exporters. So collaboration with the private sector is a long tradition uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. It's been happening. So it's a question that comes back often specifically to traceability. How have we worked together? So already all the data, all the all the transactional data of this trade will be open to each stakeholder, including traceability. But as far as marketing laws and protection of data of per personal data of the producers, but all, um, all those in the supply chain and each one at their level will have access of the database for the transactions that have to do with them. And I think that this has already uh, been um, reported by the direction of ca coffee and cacao. But it is very important because the production phase and the data registry will not be done by the regulator. It will also be done by the stakeholders of the private sector. And so you can say that it is the, the working heel. Um, so in the current case, after the implementation of these tools of, of traceability, we are then going to go to the next phase. And of course, we are going to need to clarify the participation of this private sector because there will necessarily uh, be a need to define this uh, change in modality and matching this uh, data that is collected by the private sector and the Côte d'Ivoire state because for sure certain producers uh, you know with the have access to this to this data but they were not, maybe they didn't go through a census. So we want to make sure that all these producers are in this system of traceability. We are not going to be able to uh, to move on uh, over the private sector to complete and participate in the update of this data. So the private sector is going to be with the public center um, in a consultation census. So we are going to define together, that's the modality, right? These two parts or parties. For us, it's the two, it's the two, two faces of the same coin. This is what it is for us. All the stakeholders are going to, to have to produce this. That's, that's really what I have to say. Uh, actually, you did um, talk about how we are going to uh, uh, cover these costs and how we're going to finance this. I think that the state has has given the, the, the coffee and, and cocoa council the moderation of this uh, information. And I think that this is how financing came to Côte d'Ivoire through the council. Maybe tomorrow in the, in the elaboration and creation, all the other 
processes, things will, will go through an evolution. But as of right now, I really cannot say that, that, that the fiscality that will be necessary for this uh, platform of traceability has already been designed. It is not the case for me. The financing by the Council of Coffee and Cacao, but the private sector has already financed for those who already have the traceability system and they will be updating them so that they correspond on the specifications of the technical spe specifications of the national system. Those are the ones who are going to support the updating of their systems where they have already invested. So that what I'm trying to say is that the private sector has already invested with the existing system and I know they're going to invest one more time and the things will be much clearer and um, for everyone in the next moments. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, Olivier, what, what is clear from what, what, what Benjamin Walker was talking about is the fact that there is a, a commitment to continue to work with the private sector. And there's also an expectation. Um, financial data, implementation of traceability. But from the companies themselves, from, from um, your perspective, Olivier, what is your expectation, your need from the government in order to, for you to invest more in traceability? Um, what needs to happen in terms of policy, in terms of capacity, in terms of um, dialogue and communication? Over to you, Olivier. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Um, I mean, let me first acknowledge really the great efforts that are being done by both uh, Ivory Coast and Ghana in this respect. Um, and um, I mean, and I have to say also that at, uh, all of this has also been accelerated and, and been, uh, stimulated by through the Framework for Action under the Coconut Force Initiative that was launched in, in 2017, because it really uh, uh, showed, first of all, the, the, the sense of urgency, both on the side of the governments and the side of the industry to address the topic of, uh, of deforestation. But we also acknowledge that it's not just about addressing deforestation. I, I think it has mentioned uh, today, not only this session, but in other sessions, it's about an integrated approach. It's not just addressing on the one hand, environmental, on the other hand, social, you know, when you do address uh, the environmental issues, you are addressing the social issues and vice versa. They go together. But everything really starts with uh, a national traceability system. Uh, as I said before, you know, knowing uh, where cocoa is produced and by whom, under which conditions, that is really essential. And if it comes about expectations, I think this is really mutual. I mean, mutual on the side of, you know, from the government towards industry, from the industry towards uh, government. Um, and I think that you know the, the companies through the CFI action plans demonstrate their commitments and which actions they are taking since uh, 2018, and also the governments through their national action plans. And I think if uh, what it's all about, if we want to bring this to the next level, it's going to be about uh, collective coordinated action, um, how we can help each other uh, create synergies. And I think as companies, we have been investing a lot in the past years in traceability systems, mapping farms, um, investing a lot of uh, time and energy also in data cleaning, because it's not just about going to a farm or collect data, it's verifying if that data is correct or not, and also continuously updating that information. And I think so there's, a, I think, um, a very um, positive uh, situation right now, a foundation that we can really complement each other so the government with the actions they have done with the farmer census, with the cocoa management system, the information that companies have through their mapping activities, bring that together and, and together building and, and, and bringing forward this national traceability system. Because I think it's all in all our interest to know which farmers are producing cocoa, what is the situation on their farm, what is the situation at their household, um, and to provide the needed support to farmers and also to ensure compliance with um, you know, requirements from, for example, consuming countries, uh, for example, the EU uh, uh, regulations. But it's really also to support farmers in a way that we can help them uh, to thrive better, uh, economically, socially, uh, and we need to work together in that respect. And it comes to you know, policies, it's about um, 
policies around land tenure. It has been mentioned before today. Um, we want, as industry, to support farmers with, um, you know, changing their land in a way that they can, on one hand, increase cocoa productivity, but also to diversify the activities on their farm. And by doing so, increase their, their, uh, their income, but also to become more resilient to climate change. Um, but for this, we need policies also addressing those farmers in areas which uh, potentially have to be relocated. Uh, so what we call the social safeguards, that's where we need to uh, work together, uh, reforestation projects off farm. So there's a lot of areas I think where we have both identified that industry and government, which are key priorities. And I think that under the framework of uh, the Coke and Force Initiative, there's a clear, uh, uh, I think, uh, willingness to collaborate together. Uh, if I look at the industry side, what is very positive is that we are really developing, like coming together and try to develop collective data sets, uh, methodology around deforestation risk assessment. And I'm very happy also to see that on the side of, uh, for example, in Ivory Coast, you know, in the national satellite monitoring uh, uh, system to track deforestation, that this is uh, really moving uh, forward. Um, and that will also help industry to, to um, you know, to perform our uh, activities better. But it's really about coming together. I think that's that's the essence here. And doing this under the framework of the Coca Force Initiative um, and, and uh, together uh, provide farmers in the, the necessary support to uh, thrive better. Thank you, Olivier. And, and I really appreciate the, 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 the points you're making about directly connecting this to other key priorities around you know, deforestation risk assessments, connecting this to the Cocoa and Forest Initiative and, and, and how traceability really does play a role in everything that we're trying to do around traceability. Mr. Traore, I mean, we're, 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 we're talking a lot about what we want to do. What, what, what is our vision for traceability and how, you know, industry is going to work with government and vice versa. But at the end of the day, what I want to get from you right now is a perspective of how this actually gets implemented on the ground. How are you working directly with the farmers? How do you take this idea of improving traceability in actually making it work on the ground? What are the key steps that you're taking? How are you working with government and, and the, the cooperative and the farmers? G give us a little sense about the, the reality of improving traceability. What does that look like? Vous allez m'excuser, mais j'ai du mal à entendre la traduction. Je n'ai pas entendu la traduction. Je ne pourrais pas reprendre ce Steph, I'm sorry, I did not hear the interpretation. So. If you could explain the question to him real quick. Um, I, I would try to, to wrap up. <laughs> uh, what we ask is, how do you Vous mettez, vous mettez en place tout, what, tout ce qui est nécessaire pour le terrain. What do you do comment vous travaillez um, avec les, pro les producteurs to comment to ensure que traceability on the ground? Pour que tout ce qu'on décrit là paraît assez abstrait. Everything we're describing, which seems rather abstract, how do you actually uh, close to what you said or? D'accord, merci beaucoup Stéphanie. Euh, donc, euh, pour répondre à, à votre question. S'il vous plaît. Cela sera possible euh, si, en réalité, on essaie quand même d'adapter ces d'adapter ces différents outils à la réalité. En même temps, c'est un peu... Ça sera un peu... C'est un peu difficile pour les producteurs qui n'ont pas un, un grand niveau parce qu'il y a des logiciels, par exemple, qui, qui demandent peut-être des, des cas d'identité de, nationale et il y a des producteurs qui n'en ont pas. 
Et en même temps aussi, si les, ces gens de logiciel rejettent ces, ces personnes, ils seront en même temps délaissés pour compte. En même temps, c'est de pouvoir At mettre en place If these measures, her traceability measures, taking into account the reality of the producers on the ground. But otherwise, aside from that, this is something they do already. The systems of traceability with different uh, producer notebooks, they have different systems that help them know what they've spent and other things. They all have these are, they all have some tools. These become uh, digital tools. So there's a certain amount of time, adaptation time required. They are for innovation. They, they all are for it. Si c'est un peu trop radical, ça sera peut-être... Si c'est un peu trop radical, ça sera peut-être... Si c'est un peu trop radical, ça sera peut-être... Si c'est un peu trop radical, ça sera peut-être... Si c'est un peu trop radical, ça sera peut-être... Si c'est un peu trop ça fait aujourd'hui euh, près de... Today we have, it's been about eight years that we've been doing this certification process. So there has been a change of mentality. To uh, put into place the different requirements and uh, help with traceability. So I believe that today there's a, a good many tools that exist that allow us to uh, conform to the reality on the ground that the producers are facing. The production by the producers in their parcels of land and everything is mapped out, so it's really helping, sorry, really helping us to uh, implement traceability and to allow this to be realized. Now, actually, there really is a, a possibility of seeing the reality. It's no longer theoretical. Thank you, Mr. Traoré. Um, we've come to the end of the session. There were a number of great questions that came from the audience, and we'll do our best to, to answer those as well. I really want to take the opportunity very quickly to, to thank our entire panel, Mr. Walker, Mr. Opoku, um, Olivier, Stephanie Kajo, Mr. Traore. I think you guys gave very great perspectives about the vision, future, challenges, opportunities, building partnerships around traceability from the national down to the farm level. Thank you all very much. Thank you, audience. And now I'm going to turn this over to Christy. Thank you so much, Ethan. And thank you to all the panelists for that excellent panel on traceability. It is almost time to join our breakout sessions. Um, before that, we will hear from Martin Short, WCF president. After Martin's concluding comments, we will have breakout sessions on resilience by working together, satellite imagery, and what a cocoa virus is teaching us about sustainability. That's the first set of breakout sessions. After those, we'll have the second set of breakout sessions on the topics of savings groups, land tenure, and Brazil's cocoa recovery. For now, it is time for me to say my goodbyes. That is, this is the end of the partnership meeting plenary. It has been a great pleasure being your host for these two days, and I look forward to seeing all of you again soon. And I give the floor now to Martin Short to wrap up this 2021 partnership meeting. Bye-bye, everyone, and over to you, Martin. Rosie, thank you very much indeed um, uh, for that. Uh, and thank you, Ethan, for that. that was a great traceability uh, um, section. You did so many thanks from me on that. Um, just, I want to thank everybody for attending I mean, and for, for all those people who put the work in behind the scenes to make this happen. I, you know, I do express a little bit of regret that uh, the technology gremlins uh, kidnapped part of the uh, partnership meeting 
uh, on the first part of the day yesterday and interrupted this, and I apologize for that. And listen, also apologies for those uh, you know, colleagues uh, in, in West Africa, particularly that we cut short by a rather a sort of an officious um, adherence to our, to our timing schedule. Um, and glad that we were able to get some of them uh, uh, back on. And, uh, Mr. Kearney was dragged away unexpectedly to have a meeting with a, with a minister um, and these things happen and we hope to get a, you know, a prepared speech or, or a video from him that we can post on, online. Uh, you know, big thanks to our sponsors, without which we could not hold something uh, like this. And of course, all the other speakers and moderators who put the the time aside to uh, give us the, uh, the knowledge of their of their expertise over many years of, of undertaking understandings in in the complexities of of, of a supply chain such as cocoa. Uh, and lastly, to to all the people who who attended. I mean, I think you know, without you guys attending this and, uh, and hearing all your posts and seeing your posts on the side, you know, this, this wouldn't be a, a, a such a rich uh, meeting without you. So thank you very much indeed. And, you know, it was a real pleasure for me to, uh, you know, to hear that for the first time, such a varied number of experts on such a wide range of topics. So for me, especially, it was such a huge learning curve. Uh, but, uh, and there is a but, um, you know, we can't afford to continually have meetings that don't have conclusions as an outcome. Um, you know, that's sort of the de definition of insanity, you know, undertaking the same activities time and time again, uh, yet expecting a different outcome. Um, you know, we need to make a difference. We need to hold ourselves uh, to account for these improvements. Um, and that's really important. You know, I refer back to my you know, I refer back to my two photographs, one taken in 1959, the other taken in 2021. You know, we have to change those pictures. Uh, we need to see and, and measure progress. So what do we focus on? Let's focus on poverty. It drives everything. Let's think through holistic programming and not silent interventions. Traceability uh, is critical. And let's not make traceability a, a unique selling proposition owned by an institution or a government body or, or, or even worse, all of them. And everyone thinks that they have a monopoly on excellence. Uh, we need to sign up to one traceability protocol uh, and roll this out without compromise. Uh, and in doing so, we, we must drive a significant price between price differential between traceable and non-traceable cocoa. You, the farmers are not going to sign up to traceability protocols unless they are paid to do so. You've got to have incentives and reward systems. And if the price is so minimal, then they'll look at the guy next door not undertaking this and, and, and they will think that why is it worth it? So let's think about how we make sure that we think through rewards um, and benefits for those people undertaking the protocols um, that we think are important and indeed are important. Let's think through systemic reform. You know, without systemic reform, we are not going to get sustainability. So let's change that narrative there, uh, and that's important. And of course, what was this today? What was this the last two days about? Well, it was about partnerships, doing things together. And I know from my experience of working in uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa for the last decade, you know, nothing can be achieved without partnerships, and, and certainly that applies to the World Cocoa Foundation uh, equally uh, to anybody else. And finally, listen, I, you know, I think sometimes we get sort of uh, wrapped up in a vortex called Parkinson's Law. You know, Parkinson's Law states that, you know, work expands to fill the time allowed for its completion. And you see, we don't give ourselves time limits for uh, these discussions. Uh, we have no finish line. We have no goalposts. You know, we're on that journey of that endless journey within a Mobius strip. And I think it's important we, we think through setting a time that we're going to deliver things. Let's, let's make it ambitious and, and, and let's all get there together. So let's start thinking about a date, for example. What date do we put in the diary that we're going to deliver um, a, a traceability protocol that, that everyone signs up to? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's certainly sooner rather than later. And I'd love to hear from all of you uh, as what you think that date should be. And, and please email me or, or post on the chat I'd like to get one out. I think it's very important. You know, with that, um, you know, have a great rest of the week. Thank you very much indeed for all those people who participated, all the moderators, all the speakers. Uh, and I look forward to having 
uh, a trip to Ghana and the Ivory Coast uh, in 10 days time, walking the value chain, meeting the farmers and meeting all the people involved in the supply chain. So from me, thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon.